Aloha, everyone. My name is Sabrina Shizu McKenna, and I'm honored to serve as the moderator on today's panel. Uh, I happen to be the first open member of the LGBTQ community of Asian Pacific American heritage uh, to serve on a state court of last resort. I was appointed to this position in 2011. I was a trial judge before that for 17 years. I was a member of the bar, a law professor before that. And so I am definitely the oldest person on this panel. Just to let you know, I, hear, I am here in Hawaii. The weather is beautiful. Um, Hawaii has an interesting history in terms of LGBTQ history. Uh, in the Hawaiian culture, being LGBTQ was widely accepted. It is well known that the kings and queens had same-sex lovers. They were accepted and respected. Uh, being uh, there is there are terms called mahu and aikane in the Hawaiian language, which depict uh, transgender as well as the same-sex uh, partners of uh, prominent people. Uh, it was when the white missionaries came to Hawaii. Uh, that the tradition started to change and there was a little bit more discrimination uh, with the introduction also of Christianity to Hawaii. I came to Hawaii in 1974 after graduating from a United States DOD high school in Tokyo, Japan. I came to Hawaii uh, for college, stayed for law school, fell in love with this place. Um, I was not able to come out as I didn't feel I was able to come out as a lesbian until the law changed in 1991 when Hawaii became the third state to uh, disallow discrimination against lesbians and gays only. It wasn't until a while later that transgender and gender identity was covered under our employment discrimination law. So, but after that, uh, I felt comfortable more and more coming out, but initially it was just to some friends at work. And at that time I was teaching at the law school, it's a liberal place like that, and it was still hard to come out in 1991. In any event, that shows you the importance of the United States Supreme Court's Bostock decision. I do believe that there will be more and more people coming out in their workplaces now, now with workplace um, protection throughout the country. Um, you know, we are here today to talk about um, discrimination, issues regarding um, discrimination against people of color, even within the LGBTQ community. And you would think that we, members of the LGBTQ community, understanding discrimination uh, would realize that and hope that it wouldn't actually happen to people of color. But there are specific issues that people of color in the LGBTQ community do face, and we would like to talk about some of them with you today and raise awareness on some of these issues, then talk about uh, what we might be able to do about them. Um, so uh, without further ado, I want to introduce our uh, panelists, um, Taylor Brown, staff attorney with the ACLU, Bentita Malakia, who is the global, global diversity and inclusion lead of uh, Hogan Levels, as well as Robert Raven, Raven, who is the president and founder of the public policy firm, The Raven Group, that includes in its work the bringing of diversity and equity to boardrooms, think tanks, and corporations. So I would like to go ahead and have our panelists speak now. And we're going to start with uh, Taylor. I'm going to ask that you introduce yourself more in depth and discuss your own personal experiences um, about your the intersection of between being an LGBTQ person and a person of color. So Taylor. Alrighty. Hello, everyone. Um, again, my name is Taylor Brown. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I am a staff attorney with the American Civil Liberties Union, and I work in our LGBT and HIV project. Um, a bit about me. So I am originally from North Carolina. That's where I spent a good 24 years of my life. Um, and Justice McKenna, just to let you know, I'm actually 85, just lots of good surgery. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> um, no. Um, 
yeah, so that's where I spent the majority of my time. Um, after graduating um, from undergrad, I decided that I needed a law degree in healthcare. So I decided to move to New York City. And um, I left for a brief spell to live in Atlanta for two years. Um, but now I am back in the city and with the ACLU. Um, before the ACLU, I was with Lambda Legal um, Defense and Education Fund um, for almost three years. Um, doing the same job that I do now, impact litigation um, primarily and other forms of advocacy for um, primarily transgender people, um, but the LGBTQ people in, um, in all of our community and all people living with HIV. Um, but particularly my interest has been focused on the intersection of race and LGBTQ status. So I had the fortune of being born biracial, I identify as a biracial African-American woman, um, I had the fortune of being born trans, and I had the fortune of being born poor. So I was put at a lot of intersections um, that have shaped my life up until this point. Um, and so when we talk about personal experiences, um, you know, this panel is aimed at what we can tackle in the legal profession. So that starts at law school, um, all the way up to firms and the different sectors of our profession, including the courts, nonprofit sector, um, and so I guess I can begin at law school. Like most, these problems exist in um, all higher education, not just graduate schools and um, graduate degree programs, but law school was a beast of its own. I'm a first generation college student, um, the only person in my family um, thus far um, to um, go to college and then go to law school. Um, and so when I came to law school, I had no idea what I was doing, no clue. Um, and after spending three years of that, um, primarily just trying to get healthcare, um, um, looking back on it, um, and now as I've moved into my mission um, and work, and I still have relationships with my friends from school, um, we look back at some of the many societies that um, people of color face in law school, especially black folks. There is just so much unfairness um, in the law school process in terms of um, what people have access to. Um, again, for many, for myself and my friends who are primarily all black people of color, um, we're first generation um, students in, in, in all, in undergrad and law school. Um, and so uh, another factor that sort of, you know, it's not just about being black, but is poverty. And we know the statistics around um, African-Americans and poverty, the rate of death that African-Americans incur to go to school um, and the income um, wealth gap um, that exists in this country. And so for a lot of us, dealing with the complexities of poverty on top of living in New York City and being in law school um, um, was a huge thing, especially for me. Um, I had to make many hard decisions. I had never bought a suit in my life. Um, I had to buy a suit. You have to sacrifice for those things. You learn that other students are purchasing outlines from websites that help them get A's on exams. I didn't have money to purchase that <laughs> outlines. Um, I didn't have money to purchase, um, to go to Barnes and Noble and um, purchase guides and things like that. All of the advantages that are given to people who have money and who tend to be not people of color um, make law school just an unfair game from the beginning. Um, and then the fact that everything goes on to be based on your first year grades, again, it's just unfair. Um, for a lot of people who are coming into this for the first time and who are living um, and dealing with discrimination their entire lives and all forms and the trauma that it's taken. Um, and then going into my first job, again, a lot of this occurs at the intersection of being poor and being black um, and being trans. Um, but you know, my first job, I decided that I needed more healthcare. I went to my healthcare plan and it had an exclusion. Um, so I was suing employers um, and holding them to a higher standard of healthcare than my employer was giving me. And, you know, I always tell people that, I guess, you don't get volcano insurance until you get a volcano. And I'm very much a volcano. Um, and so that was unacceptable to me. And it got to the point, um, unfortunately, where I tried to negotiate, um, but I ultimately had to threaten to sue. And that's a very tough, <laughs> tough position to be in um, as a trans person, as a person of color who only wants health care. And for many of us, this is the first time that we've had access to comprehensive health care. Um, aside from the other things that I've experienced that many people of color face in um, in our profession, including the attrition rates of other people of color, especially women of color, 
I started with a group of law fellows, and so I was able to see the different tracks that the my white peers were on, and I could and I could see very clearly that um, they were getting assigned cases, they were given litigation duties, they were assigned more substantive things, and again, I you know you're not choosing me, you're not choosing to work with me. It's either you don't like me or you don't think I'm competent, and you don't know me not to like me, so you must believe that I'm incompetent. Um, and that's a, that's a very hard feeling. We already coming in knowing sort of what people think, affirmative action, we're only here because the standards have been lowered. Um, and so we're very well aware of that. Um, and so that's very hard, um, but I believe I'm over my five minutes. Um, I'll definitely talk more, but that's a little introduction. Thanks a lot, Taylor. You know, I just want to comment on what you said. Yeah, um, yeah no, we'll, we'll come back to you, but I just wanted to comment on the LSAT situation. And it is really unfair in terms of uh, the reality is that people of color uh, do not have the same access to resources. And I can see it. I've seen so many um, people that are aspiring law students. If you can afford to take those courses that cost thousands of dollars, you can raise your LSAT score. And if you have the time uh, that you don't have to work and you can stay home and study for months at a time, you can raise your LSAT score by 25 points. You can do that. And so it does show you the unfairness of the entire system. Okay, well, why don't we turn next to Robert? Robert, please introduce yourself. Uh, first, I want to know where to get volcano insurance. <laughs> I love well, that. We'll talk about that after this. <laughs> Very hard in Hawaii. Very hard in Hawaii. Right, exactly. <laughs> I'll be using that phrase. Thank you so much. I, I could not be more honored to be to be on this event. I'm going to learn so much from the three of you. Um, I'll be taking notes and just so, so grateful for everybody's willingness to come forward and, and talk about this stuff. I, um, my name is Raven. I've been an attorney for a long time, and I've been working on public policy at the federal and state level for almost 30 years. I was a sort of a dweeby lawyer at Arnold and Porter um, in Washington, and I went to work at a big firm. I'm a, I'm a first generation attorney from magnificent parents who did not have schooling beyond high school. They were delighted for anything that I was able to do. And I just didn't have a lot of mentoring. And I went to a law firm because I thought you were supposed to, and I could get a job and I was going to earn more money than anyone in my family had earned in generations cumulatively, which was true. Um, and Arnold and Porter was a fine firm as firms go. But for me, it was a uh, short of a nightmare uh, being in the closet and sort of I learned right away, I treated it as finishing school for the upper class, that it was going to be sort of a, a graduate degree in vernacular, how to talk, the mores, the vacation rhythms, et cetera, about the upper class, which was heavily white. Uh, and, you know, I, I can pass for white um, and took advantages of all of that, but um, was miserable there and got a life when I realized that in Congress, uh, and in most governments, people use law degrees to move public policy in a way that really improves some people harm. But I was focused on improving lives of people I cared about. So I got a job as counsel to Congressman Barney Frank, although I thought I was closeted. He thought I was out. Um, and it changed my life. I realized that uh, public policy is about power. And for people who care about shifting power to women, to people of color, to LGBTQ, it's the place to be. And I've never turned back. 10 years in government, seven in Congress as uh, counsel to the Judiciary Committee for the Democrats, and then three years running a division of the Department of Justice. I'm the first, what we then called homosexual, um, open homosexual, J. Edgar Hoover was closeted. I'm the first gay person to be gay man to be confirmed to a law enforcement position in the United States. And it was no joke being uh, being gay, running a division of the Department of Justice. But I learned a tremendous amount, including a deep appreciation for what a tough job it is keeping people safe. More excitedly for me, um, I've had almost 20 years running an unusual public affairs firm. There are 80 of us, we're majority people of color, we're 95% majority and female, we're a plurality gay, uh, lesbian, transgendered, et cetera. 
And we're unusual in the private sector. We're not organized around profit. We're organized around what I said, shifting power to women, people of color, um, and many other communities that we care about, the visibly disabled, body type, all kinds of discrimination that goes on that people don't even want to talk about, religious discrimination, et cetera. And it's been, uh, in the beginning, it was sort of freakish for an openly gay man to be running a private sector firm. Now we have some peers. Um, and it's and it's gotten a little better. I've learned a tremendous amount. The number one thing that I've learned, and we'll talk about it in the Q and A, but the sort of at, at the Raven Group, we staff movements. Reproductive rights being the one closest to my heart. Uh, immigration, civil liberties, civil rights, criminal justice reform, et cetera. We take on the tough stuff. We run an anti-sex trafficking foundation. We have, we have, we're one of the few, if only, public affairs firms in the country to regrettably have people on death row. So we take on tough stuff. And what I've noticed over the years is that movements in which white men are active and involved have progressed, and that includes gay marriage, and movements that are organized by and for the relief of women and people of color have not only not progressed, but in many ways been set back voting rights, choice, et cetera. And so regrettably, the sort of intellectual property, which is whiteness, it's overvalued, it's commodified and marketed well beyond what should be its normal value in a fair market, is the determinant variable in whether or not people will be free. And that's a ridiculous society. And some of the worst actors around this sort of insistence on whiteness as a means of progression are gay leadership. It will change as the country changes and insists on different gay leadership. But the first generations of gay leadership over-focused on the advancement of white people. And we'll talk about it in the Q&A, but it was an abject and absolute centering of white maleness, in part because that was the comfort level of the leadership, in part because it was a strategy to present us to the American public as, quote, just like them, end quote, which really meant just like other people in power. And we can debate the sort of ups and downs of that strategy, but it was a clear strategy, and it's a strategy that needs to be shelved. Um, and I'm, I'm doing my best to sort of talk about it and work with people who are ready for a different um, presentation. So thank you very much for having me, Judge. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, Bendita, please go ahead. Introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Bendita Cynthia Malakia. I'm a global diversity and inclusion lead at Hogan Lovells. And uh, the remarkable thing about having uh, two co-panelists and a wonderful moderator um, who go before you as they allow you to think about yourself in a different way. And so I thought about the way I might introduce myself and I'm going to change it up a little bit to look at myself um, through a lens in which um, Taylor actually uh, sparked and that's of thinking about my interest in large law firms and corporate um, as a direct result of uh, of my own, you know, class background, which started off being kind of solidly middle class in the way that most Americans think they're solidly middle class, um, but actually transitioned downwards into poverty um, as I was coming of age and, and went into college. And so I was raised in upstate New York. I've got family in North Carolina, um, uh, as Taylor does. And um, I ended up at Barnard College, and it was a whole new world to me, um, where people talked about uh, going to uh, private boarding schools as if that wasn't a punishment. Um, and people talked about, um, uh, you know, supper <laughs> clubs and all sorts of other access um, to institutions um, and practices that I had never had never imagined. Um, and I ended up going to law school because I always wanted to go to law school. I, I went to Harvard Law School, and I thought that I would be a civil rights lawyer, um, but discovered that throughout college, um, the impact of having been poor, of having walked four and a half miles back and forth 
um, uh, to uh, an unpaid internship for a summer, um, which allowed me to lose 60 pounds uh, that summer, but also uh, wore me out physically and um, and ended up putting additional burdens on my life that others um, that were similarly situated didn't uh, necessarily face. Um, led me to think about the need to be able to access um, capital. Um, and as soon as I was um, able to, um, between uh, college, which I graduated early from because I just could not afford to go one more semester, um, I ended up working at Paul Weiss as a corporate paralegal. Um, and that was really the first time that I had any access um, to resources. Um, and in so converted my desire to be a civil rights lawyer and to my desire to do anything that I thought was interesting that I could leverage for the benefit of people, recognizing kind of housing discrimination and everything, real estate was the thing that I was going to focus on. Um, of course, I graduated from law school in 2008 and real estate was dead. And I ended up uh, practicing project finance law, um, mostly focused on um, African development finance um, infrastructure, energy, power, um, social infrastructure, um, and spent a, a large number of years uh, at uh, Norton Rose Fulbright, then Fulbright and Jaworski, um, doing that. And I, I loved it because it was the one area of law that I could see as against my colleagues, where I could do something to help people that looked like me while still making a significant amount of money. Um, and that was important to me because I soon became the primary breadwinner for my family um, and uh, myself in a separate city um, and other extended family. And so um, my life was then a life of, of having to do a job that I, I, I loved uh, intellectually. And it was more and more intellectually as I went down the line and ended up being uh, a job where um, at some point in time, once I paid off my student loans, it didn't necessarily feel um, that tenable anymore. But my colleagues, um, in particular, my white colleagues, even my white gay colleagues, um, felt free uh, to make choices um, that I didn't have, feel like I had the luxury to make, in part because when you're black and you go to uh, law school um, and you get a job where you make good money, um, there is a, an extreme amount of pressure um, from your whole family to continue to have a job of prestige. And so there are so many areas where even getting credentialed um, and which should offer you more choices in some, in some ways you had less. And in both of those environments at Harvard Law School and practicing law um, at, at Fulbright and Jaworski, um, I was counsel at, uh, at International Finance Corporation, both in Nairobi and in Washington, D.C. I've been, um, I was uh, vice president, uh, president, assistant general counsel at Goldman Sachs in Texas. Um, in all of these environments, I constantly felt the pressure of trying to find an environment that could help facilitate um, my growth and development and my desire to lie at the intersection of being able to be financially um, well and financially well enough to be able to support the people in my orbit, um, while also being able to do something that had some resonance of social good. Um, and I always, um, in trying to be developed in that way, I always found myself um, excluded. Um, in a, a corporate environment, you will find that the primary means of, of development are these resources, resource groups and these other affinity groups and networks um, that are supposed to support you. But when you go to uh, the LGBT group and they say, oh, let's put the race thing aside because well, we need to focus on this primary thing, right, which basically is the corporatization of their own identity that they don't allow other identities to access. Um, and then you go to the black group and they say, oh, we need to really focus on the, these black issues, right? Um, and, um, and the uh, LGBT thing is just not what we do or it might not be in alignment with black culture. Um, or if you are the bisexual person um, at the women's uh, network, they don't quite know what to do with you because they can't tell, well, who are you today? And they want you to make decisions um, so they can, they can decide how they should treat you on the basis of those decisions as if it were to matter. Um, and so um, I found very early that I, I had to be able to leverage a brand. Um, and that brand had to be my own thing because there was no group that was going to readily support me. And so I really took it upon myself to get a lot of power and energy in cultivating an identity where I was able to 
feel as if it, I was able to help others see that to be different, to be part of this um, intersectional group had power and magic that other people couldn't fathom. And it was so different that they couldn't actually criticize it because they didn't understand enough about it. And I've been lucky enough in part for others to kind of, to, to kind of be drawn to that um, and, to, uh, and to see that there's some benefit in it, in part because they're scared to criticize it. And so my mission is to really help other people, whether it's through the law firm or otherwise, um, through coaching, through other means of access that I have, to help other people create their own spaces and communities, to be able to derive their own power in the same way that Robert derives power from policy and Taylor derives power um, from, you know, uh, executing her rights under the law and, uh, and uh, Judge McKenna derives power from sitting on the bench. Um, but my power is in trying to help people cultivate and catalyze kind of individual identity to change their own particular trajectories. Thanks for letting me introduce myself. Thank you. Thank all of you. You're all such fascinating people, and I think we all have so much to learn from each other. Um, you know, let's turn to uh, LGBT dis discrimination, how challenges of racism, even within the community, impacts all of our organizations. Um, and, you know, Robert was talking about the impact of white leadership within the LGBTQ movement. I've seen it, you know, I am think I am definitely the oldest person here in terms of the same-sex marriage movement, the AIDS movement. It's really interesting when we think about the fact that the Stonewall is considered the the precursor of the modern LGBTQ rights movement. And you think about that, it was transgender women of color that really, really led that movement. And of course, three years before that, we had the same thing happening in the Tenderloin District in San Francisco, we, where we had Asian American women of transgender women of color uh, rising up against uh, police and oppression. Uh, but it is very interesting. I have found that, you know, in terms of the LGBTQ organizations, even within um, um, the judiciary, like uh, judges' organizations, it seems to be more led by uh, white uh, LGBTQ people. Um, candidly, I found more comfort, I find more comfort in participating uh, within uh, the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association, which has a very active and supportive LGBTQ, to LGBTQ organization within the organization. So therefore, I tend to go to those national conferences. Um, so let me ask you, in terms of each of your sectors, um, how, what do you see in terms of uh, white leadership or people, LGBTQ people of color not being in the positions of leadership within your organizations? Why don't we start with Taylor? Well, um, it's exact same. Uh, um, yes, um, both of the places um, that I've worked so far in my career have um, um, well, my project specifically has um, a white gay man leading it, um, and there were also white leaders um, at Lambda. Um, and yes, I did um, find that problematic. I think that uh, I always I always used to describe myself as just like a very strong personality, or you know, I, I would always figure like, what's wrong with me? Like, why don't I fit into these places? Like, why don't you know, why don't we have anything in common or the same priorities? And I just realized that the people that I work with often are fundamentally different than, than me on so many levels. Even though we are from the same community, um, my background is just so different than um, how these people um, were raised. I always feel bad saying these people, it never sounds good. Um, how my colleagues, um, um, we were just so different. and. I think what I've told people is that I've, you know, I may not have um, um, experience in terms of years, even though, you know, I'm four years in the game, um, but I have experiences. Um, and I think that's, that's what matters, especially in sort of my work in advocating for trans people um, and our rights to literally exist. Um, but there's just so much of your of my background that it's just it's very shocking to people. Um, you know, my my father and I have such a connection to the issues that I care about. Um, my father was incarcerated for over half of my life um, 
due to America's war on drugs um, and recidivism and the opportunities that young black men had um, in the 80s and 90s. Um, and, you know, my grandmother, she graduated before schools were desegregated. Um, and that's what I grew up with. Those are, that's my family. That's the issues that I care about. That's the issues that I experience. And, you know, being poor gave me a lot of opportunity to work very hard um, um, to, again, just afford basic things. Um, and so when I come into an impact litigation space and we're talking about impact litigation, of course, there are um, contours with, within which we have to work or allegedly that we have to work in terms of this is what impact litigation looks like. And so that's been my um uh, experience. It is very, it's just things that are not, it's not that they're not important. Um, as Robert said, you know, white issues move forward, gay marriage, um, um, things around adoption in some states, even on the policy level um, where we're not seeing legal um, changes, it's still sort of white driven and the concerns of white people. And I'm concerned about poverty and still having segregation and being killed in the streets and things that I just prioritize, um, and I will always prioritize above any of those things um, um, that I currently um, see sometimes. And I'm unapologetic about it. So, you know, that's always fun as well. Robert? Yeah, um, great question. I um, am careful, although I trade in all kinds of generalities and am glib beyond words, you know, it's also very careful I, I try to be careful not to see people as strictly totemic. And by that, I mean, there are white leaders in the game, in every movement, including the gay movement, who have been fantastic on equity and inclusion. Ray Carey, the longtime head of National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, you know, we're all flawed and I'm the most flawed, but she's a standout in terms of the issues that we care about. And then there are all kinds of black and Hispanic leaders across the board who were disasters on questions of equity and inclusion and and concerns for, you know, ecumenical thoughts. So I always want to be careful sort of that that demography is not coterminous um, with principles and outcome. When I was younger, we clamored for an African American Supreme Court Justice to follow Thurgood Marshall, and we clamored for a woman on the court, uh, and we got Clarence Thomas, and we got Sandra Day O'Connor, who turned out to be better than we than she was in the beginning. But sort of the importance in public life of being very precise about what you want. You want someone who sort of not just empathizes with you because they may have walked a walk, but is going to behave in a way. Um, that will be the things that we care about. So um, that's always that's always been very important to me to sort of to make sure that I'm not just focused on demography, but I'm focused on a walk um, and vice versa. But it's hard. It's hard. Yeah, you know that's when, uh, it. Just occurred to me that uh, when when I was appointed to this position, um, the. Uh, the news media wanted to uh, interview me, and I decided to be very open about being lesbian and uh, having a family and children. Um, and I thought it was really important because my last job before I got this job was with the fighting. Uh, I I was a judge of the general jurisdiction trial court, and our family court has to be headed by a general jurisdiction trial court judge. So I headed our family court for a year and a half before I uh, was appointed to this position. And the reason I decided to be so open publicly is because uh, there were some studies in the 2000s uh, about Asian Amer about youth coming out to their parents. And it was striking because um, statistically about 80% um, of um, Caucasian youth would come out to their parents, but it was only 50% for Asian Pacific Americans. And so therefore, I thought it was really important. And, and uh, the black youth and Latinx youth are in between. And of course, you know, when as a family court judge, I learned that, um, uh, you know, over like 40 percent of the homeless youth are um, LGBTQ, mainly transgender, because the, the 
parents are kicking their, them out of their homes. And that's why when I realized it was so important for there to be like representation, you know, like just to be open and say, hey, hey, you guys, you know, I'm an older person. Um, I look like you. My background is more like you. I didn't grow up in a life of privilege. I was raised by a single mom from the age of nine. Um, and, you know, I went to public school the whole way. Um, so I realized the importance of leadership having representation. I think it's really, really important. And I agree that it's so important. We can't just, it can't just be people that look like us. It has to be people that look like us and bring us up. That's what's really important, I think. So anyway, Bendita, your thoughts in terms of the firm structure sure. and to what you see. Sure. And I appreciate, you know, Robert's clarification. I think so many times for people who, who do this work, um, the things that other people, we would chastise other people for, we sometimes do. And that's using kind of, you know, uh, groups of people in, in broad terms. But what we, we mean to be talking about, right, is, is whiteness. So not white people, but kind of the, the weaponization of whiteness um, as a structure and uh, as a power system that's interwoven um, that uh, that operates in concert almost so seamlessly that we can't extract it from our primary institutions um, that serves to denigrate other people um, that do not um, benefit um, from whiteness. Um, and what I was reminded of in this is about performance. Um, we're in a moment where um, we're off the backs of um, a, a racial tragedy um, in America, and where uh, a lot of the world's attention has been focused um, on the death of a man, um, tragic, um, but we all watched it and we all watched it together in a way that I don't think we've really sat and watched um, much together um, at the same time. And some of that has to be um, the pandemic and some of that has to be the restrictions that we feel like we're under and a sense of powerlessness and and uh, a bunch of other factors. But um, what I've seen come out of that has been an outpouring of support of uh, all sorts of people, of all sorts of backgrounds. And for me, um, what I've been really cautious to see uh, and to, to kind of witness and try to parse out is about the various performances that we are all undertaking. Um, I see um, uh, that people um, that uh, tend to identify as white um, are um, trying to show up in ways that they haven't shown up before um, and uh, trying to decide, regardless of background, regardless of whether or not um, uh, they're gay or not or some other identity, um, is this authentic? Um, and how, how specific are we, are we really willing to go? And in the law firm context, um, this shows up in, you know, all of these declarations that, you know, that firms of all sizes and types make um, with respect to their kind of anti-racism commitments, right? Um, we're very willing to, it's easier for us to say, let me part with my $10 to help those people out there that I can't see and touch, that I clearly had nothing to do with. I had nothing to do with their subjugation, um, but let me go help those people and I can feel the benefits of helping those people. Um, but that same kind of incisive attention is not paid to helping the people who sit in the office next door um, get make sure that they have access uh, to matters, to make sure that they have the mentoring and the sponsorship that they need, um, to make sure that they get the origination credit for the matters that they bring into the firm, um, to make sure that they have access um, to clients and that their names show up on the articles that they stay up all night to write. And so um, it, for me, a lot of, a lot of this moment um, and a lot of what we've seen over time has been us playing allyship um, and we've seen an overabundance of playing of allyship across all different backgrounds recently. And what I'm hoping is that we can actually get to the point, um, to, to uh, Judge McKenna's point of actually being active allies, or we're actually standing up and not worried about what the optics look like and not trying to distance or separate ourselves from the problem, but to recognize where we perpetuate um, the problem. You know, Bendita, I would, I, would, I would bring that excellent point right into our community. 
the LGBT community. I think a very similar dynamic has gone on from some of the larger national organizations. And I think it's true regionally with some of the powerful LGBTQ organizations. Same thing, exact same thing. The relationship between the heavily white organizations and people of color was strictly transactional. There's no, the intersectionality was a one-way street. That is the wealthier white organizations needed black or Hispanic or Asian Pacific mobilization around a particular campaign or sort of needed Coretta Scott King to say that Dr. King would have supported gay marriage. They went in with money, they went in with support and they did the best they could. That's extremely different than a peer relationship where you draw people of color in and say, what should we do? And I've, I, you know, it's a fantasy, but I've long thought that if the human rights campaign throughout the 90s and early 2000s were an organization led by people of color, my suspicion is we would have universal health care. We would have massive change in our relationship with people of faith that there would be a significant investment in helping people who are faith-based, the Catholic Church and other evangelical churches move along the LGBT continuum. Marriage may or may not have been important. I think marriage is important to everybody, but I don't think it would have ranked in the top three, sort of. So the, the larger point is we have lacked inclusiveness where white organizations were bringing in people of color and listening to them. We just have almost no experience with that. And I'm hoping that with Alfonso David at HRC, that's obviously going to change. It's a big step for them, but we have a long way to go. That's such a good point. You know, I noticed that a lot of my friends in the Asian, Asia Pacific American community, LGBT community, have really in the past focused, and they continue to focus so much on issues like voting rights and immigration and, you know, the problems that all of the LGBTQ immigrants and uh, DACA and all these people are facing. Um, and it, it, I wish it would be much more of a focus of the LGBTQ national organizations in general, and as, as well as the issues of the transgendered people of color that are being murdered. You know, we have so many and we need to focus, our organizations need to focus more on these issues. Um, I'm sorry, I, that uh, is my personal thought. Uh, but in any event, uh, we will now move on and talk about, um, you know, solutions. Where do we go from here? So we've kind of talked about what we see as some of the issues, and I'm sure there are so many other issues that we could be discussing, but where do we go from here? And how do we talk to our, our, our uh, allies here, all of our friends within the community? How do we improve this situation? Um, you know, I believe there's a uh, report from the MCCA, the Minority Corporate Council Association. Uh, they have, and it deals more with women and people of color within the legal profession, a lot of practical solutions. Uh, but, um, and I encourage everybody to read that report. Uh, but let's, I'm going to start with uh, Bendita this time. What can we do? Where do we go from here? It's such a big question, so I'll stick to my lane, um, which tends to be, <laughs> which tends to be, um, you know, large law firms and how individuals can help um, improve themselves to be, you know, better allies. And on the individual level, you know, I would say that wherever you are, you need to break down the silos between diversity groups. Um, we spend so much time in, um, you know, black affinity groups or Asian affinity groups or Latinx affinity groups, women's groups, um, and there's utility, um, LGBT groups, there's utility in all those spaces. Um, but um, it, figuring out ways that we can have work streams where we're working together arm in arm on issues that are common. Um, what occurs to me is that for those of us who lie at the intersection of several marginalized identities, what we're constantly fighting for are fundamental rights that can advance the infrastructure and the way of life for everyone and not um, for those who tend to have less uh, intersectional identities. They tend to be fighting for uh, more whipped cream on uh, you know, top of the cheesecake. And so um, I like whipped cream too. 
Um, but uh, to the extent that we can be focused on more fundamental issues, um, uh, the better. And we need to work together um, in order to do that. I think oftentimes asking the question, so I sit um, as part of this organization of women, uh, uh, of, of leaders um, of women's uh, lawyer organizations, as I am uh, treasurer for the National LGBT Bar Association, and I tend to represent that organization for um, a variety of different kind of women's initiatives. Um, and I um, am reminded that there's, there tends to only be one question that I need to ask every time another leader of a women's organization says something. They talk about a report that they've created or a program that they've asked. The only question that I need to ask is, what women are you talking about? That Usually that's all I need to do and it changes the whole conversation because most of the time they haven't thought about um, what women are they talking about? Are we talking about trans women? Are we talking about um, bi women? Are we talking about queer women? Are we talking about, and you know, what women are we talking about? And I urge um, uh, individuals who lead LGBT spaces, um, who are part of their LGBT affinity group at work or, or who lead LGBT organizations to think about that. Like what queer people are we talking about here? And let's be clear about it. Um, and it's not to say that I don't, that I'm ignoring the realities. Um, sometimes there are resource challenges. Sometimes there are data collection challenges. Sometimes there are other challenges. Um, but I urge all of us to ask, how can we do this and not provide the 16 reasons why we can't, why we can't do it? Um, I would urge people to stop telling me, oh, it must be doubly or triply hard for you. I know that. I live like me every day, right? I don't, you know, you don't need to come, you know, provide me with your kind of over kind of performative and stylized empathy about how my life is so hard. Um, what I would prefer you do is I prefer a reasonable acknowledgement of people's circumstances, but then tell me, what do you intend to do about it? Like, tell me, as Rihanna said, pull up. How do you intend to pull up? You know, show, show up. What are you going to say? What are you going to do? Um, how are you going to make it slightly less hard for me the next time you have an opportunity? Or when I come to you, because I am the person who, if you say you're an ally, I treat you like an ally that works. And so if you say you're an ally, then I say, oh, okay, well, I'm about to go in this meeting and nobody's about to hear what I have to say. And so um, I need you to back me up on this and I will require you to back me up. When everyone's silent, I will say, Jenny, what do you, do you agree with me? Then I'll keep looking at you until you show me who you are, right? I mean, this is, I think, th and this is reasonable to expect because I am the person that does that for other people. Like I, I will pull up for you, um, you, you pull up for me. Um, so a couple of individual reasons. I know I didn't get into the bias report. All of you can look it up. It's great. The basic, the basic takeaway is that most of those dynamics that apply, the prove it again bias, um, the tightrope that you have to walk. So basically looking for, for people of color, women, LGBT people, um, we, are, we are, are adjudicated on the basis of our past performance and not on our potential or our possibilities. Um, and so that means that we have to prove that we've already done it to get the opportunity instead of what we might be able to do on the basis of our brilliant smile and promise. Um, and so, um, you know, all that applies to LGBT people. It applies um, even more so to people that lie at the intersections, the tightrope bias of having to be, you know, the kind of the, the, the phenomenon of too hot, too cold, just right, just always trying to get the temperature right um, in order for people to accept you and to take your level of acceptability. Um, um, all of these types of biases are biases that apply to all of these communities, um, not just women, not just women, not just people of color. And so I encourage you to go download the report. They have a very, very digestible 52 page executive summary. Um, <laughs> um, it is digestible. It's just a little, it's just long. Um, but you can, everyone can take a look at that. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a good piece of work to provide some actionable tips, especially if you're in a corporate environment. I'm not sure it's as applicable if you're not, but if you're in a corporate or if you're in a law firm, um, it's a it's a solid piece of work. But I really do encourage people, like there are systems to break down and I'm sure others have better um, suggestions for the societal systems that need to be broken down. But I'm interested in what are you about to do tomorrow in your own life? Because the individual actions aren't that hard so long as you have a mindset and a little bit of courage and a willingness to do it. Great suggestions. You know, yeah, the FCCA uh, interrupting bias suggestions. Uh, the executive summary 
uh, is 52 pages. I was looking for the executive summary when I realized that the entire thing was the executive summary. Uh, but yeah, it, even though it does focus, focus on the corporate world, I really thought that the suggestions in terms of hiring were really applicable to all sectors and um, some great suggestions there. I'm gonna turn to Taylor. Please talk about what uh, you what suggestions that you might have going forward. Well, normally I would charge a consultancy fee for this, but you're going to get some gems. Uh, let's go throw that out there. Um, first, jumping off a point that Bendita made, I was just thinking about this um, earlier. Um, I, I was like, I never want to hear the world word resilient again. Um, I can't tell you how many times someone says to me, oh my God, you're so resilient. And I'm like, I didn't want to be resilient. <laughs> you know, like, believe me, that was not fun for me. Um, I... Yeah, I just, it's, you know, it's it's more so what are you going to do? Walk, walk the walk and talk the talk. Um, and so in regards to, I have, um, first I should say that I come from a position that I think that this country owes black people and transgender people a lot, um, a lot. And so this profession also owes black and transgender people a lot. Our profession is, if not the biggest, is one of the biggest feeders into state legislatures, the federal government, our courts, of course, um, um, every sort of facet of society where we see disparate outcomes for black people and for transgender people. And so the idea that we don't, that we shouldn't do more and be doing more is just absurd to me. Um, I'll say this, um, solving racism is expensive. Um, I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news. Um, but it's expensive and uh, that's just that. Um, and again, if you think about the years of free labor that were taken, um, taken into account to build this country, um, to fight for the Civil Rights Act, to use that Civil Rights Act to then expand LGBTQ rights, um, probably a drop in the bucket. And so some of the main ways are A, make space. I think that people of color are, especially in the LGBTQ movement, I think that we've hit a point where I see a, a fabulous crop of, um, of my peers um, who are black and brown and who are, you know, I made it known at my first day at the ACLU that my job, uh, you know, my goal was to be leading it. Um, it's, it's just like that. You have to make room. I think that, um, um, and I want to go back sort of to what Robert said about generalizations. I've had amazing white people who should teach classes on allyship in my life. Um, and that goes to my point of mentorship. Mentorship has been huge in my life. Um, um, I wouldn't be where I am today without um, so many people. Um, I'm not going to do a list. You know, this is an award ceremony. Um, but mentorship is so huge for people of color um, coming into, um, um, again, a profession, an organization, a lifestyle. Uh, um, uh, a place where you walk in, you don't see people like you, you don't necessarily fit in, and you have a lot of questions. And having someone, I told someone in an exit interview, which I have to keep, I have to keep bringing these up, um, but they said, what, what was the best trait about your um, um, supervisor? I said, she asked me how I was doing emotionally. She asked about my mental health. Like, that was fabulous to me. I have never encountered that, and it just, it changed. Our relationship, she saw me as a person, and as a young professional, and that was huge. And it's so, if you don't get that mentorship, and I'm sure Bendita can concur in the firm um, situation, as I talk to many of my friends who are at large law firms, if you don't get the proper mentor, that mentorship, your track at the firm is sort of skewed, potentially for the rest of your time there until you ultimately leave. Um, pay equity is also huge. Now this is gonna be very unpopular, but I'm just gonna say it. Going back to my first point about how much um, um, this country and this profession owes black people, people of color, and trans people, um, I think that all firms, firms in particular, private firms, um, should set up LRAP programs. I think that um, they should take a holistic approach and look at people who, I believe they were termed um, class migrants. I've actually never heard that term before, but um, I don't consider myself a class migrant because I'm still very much in a lot of the same financial situation that I was, <laughs> um, um, marginally better. Um, but um, firms should definitely set up an LRAP um, a program to help people of color repay loans. I mean, I think that's just a natural, I know people are gagging like we would never. Um, I think it's something that needs to be done. Um, public interest as well. There are many public interest um, organizations who are operating on million dollar funds. And I think, again, if you count the number of black people that you have um, <laughs> um, working there, I'm sure, you know, it's not gonna be that big of a um, um, chunk of change. But I think that is huge in pay equity because ultimately what I find is that 
people, especially people of color in the firm, because again, I have a, a mixed bag of friends who are public interest and firm. Um, ultimately, you don't have the same, uh, pay equality is that we both make $150,000. Pay equity is that we both have the same spending power. And so while I'm burdened with debts and things that again, are traceable back to, to systemic issues caused in the society by racism and transphobia and not being able to access healthcare, not being able to access housing, things of that nature. Ultimately, then I have to pay all of this money to go into a school that still isn't ready for people like me, a law school that still isn't ready for people like me, and a profession that isn't ready for people like me. And again, I think that would go a long way. Um, and again, definitely not that far, but a, a first step in terms of um, righting a lot of wrongs. Um, and again, I think holistic approaches in general are best. Again, you don't know about the person. I can give you, well, this was an experience from college. My 1L year, I had to sign a contract saying that I was not going to work. Even though my first day in New York, I went to a job interview at a gym to see if I could um, pick up some hours. Um, I had to sign a contract saying that I would not work because 1L year was that serious. Um, my last two years of college, I worked at a gym. I opened this gym Monday through Friday at 5 a.m. I went to class at 10 a.m. I got off at 6 p.m. And then I worked at Buffalo Wild Wings um, uh, four to five nights a week. And that was my life. I couldn't afford a parking pass, so I would park in a lot that was free after a certain time. I would wake up really early to get my car out of the lot before you had to pay and then return it. And it's like things like this that people, again, just you're probably never going to know about because you've never literally had no money in your bank account. Um, um, it's Poverty is very serious, and it afflicts a lot of law students. Um, and I think so. You don't know what's going on when that person had two jobs and they got to be minus in tax. <laughs> um, I do get a B minus. Not gonna. It didn't kill my career, obviously. But um, there's so much to people of color that I find who are some of the strongest, smartest people who go through so much, who have been through so much, and then to be whittled down by unfair metrics that again are proven time and time again to be racist and not inclusive. It's just ridiculous to me. And so, open your purse. Be holistic. <laughs> um, what are some other I have a whole list here. Um, let me see if I can jump, just pick one. One more. Again, investment in, I mean, I know a lot of firms, you know, I was invited to do a, um, um, a deposition training program that um, a firm, what firm was it? I would give them a shout out, but I won't. It was a, it was a large law firm. They were, they were very nice people, but they did like a week long deposition training where they hired actors, they took it very seriously, and they invited um, uh, somebody from Lambda Legal to come. Lambda Legal allowed me to go. Things like that are key. And I think assigning someone a strong mentor um, uh, beginning in their career and making sure that you have a plan, maybe even a first-year plan for all first-year associates, but especially focusing on people of color, to make sure that they're getting those opportunities and experiences is huge. Um, not just in terms of, again, what they're going to ask value add to your um, um, company. I mean, if you're public interest and you partner with firms to do impact litigation, ask them for those opportunities. The worst that they can say is no, but send, um, send your people to those kinds of training sessions because ultimately whatever you're bringing someone who is a person of color, and again, I always, I mean, I can't help but think about things from my background. Things could go very wrong very quickly for a lot of people um, if they were to lose a job that I don't think a lot of people consider. Um, and I know that's kind of like standard, but again, I often find that people don't actually have a real sense of what poverty looks like <laughs> um, um, and coming from some of the most extreme poverty. Um, um, it's, it's horrible. I think that, um, um, yeah, I don't know where I was going with that. Um, um, but yeah, just the idea that you're bringing someone into this corporation. I remember saying to some of my colleagues um, um, that they owed a duty to me. Like you brought me into this corporation, uh, or not this corporation, but this organization to to do work that I wanted to do. You hired me, I didn't hire you. And I have an expectation of what I want. I have to go on with the rest of my life. I have goals, I have things that I need to accomplish. And the idea that I'm not gonna get or get anything less than what I deserve, it's not gonna fly. And you know, a lot of folks, again, I, so many of the things that I had to do to stand up for myself were also to stand up for people, trans staff who were not lawyers and who were going without healthcare um, because of an exclusion. And I saw that and that's infuriating to me. I would never, I, you know, I am consider myself a highly principled person, Southern raising, it's horrible. I'm still trying to get rid of it. Um, but 
it's just these things are, again, and I just remember saying, you expect me to come and compete with my, with, with these other law fellows on the same level when I'm having breakdowns in the office with my manager crying because I'm dealing with serious gender dysphoria. Um, and yeah, and you know, you just expect us all to compete on the same level. That's, that's not equity. Equity is actually making an investment to make sure that everything is fair and that you're looking at someone from from a holistic approach and understanding that we didn't all get to where we are today um, by virtue of the same ladders. Um, some of us had to actually create a ladder um, and we're still creating it. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I just really think that all our legal profession needs to be more holistic about how we treat people and treat people as humans and, and, and just do better. And I think part of that, again, starts with finances, investment, um, um, and repaying the debt. <laughs> that that we have or that you all have i don't know about anybody anything except for the federal government wonderful taylor thank you Cre creating letters and investing holding hands if you're at the equal level uh, to help each other that's such important concepts robert uh i want to yield my time back to these my two co-panelists thank you for for all of that, that was really great. And I think the short version is, again, at the national level, and it's true for some of the high-powered regional organizations, having achieved power that the gay, then gay leadership set out to achieve, economic, social, political, cultural, media, it's time to uh, accept that in many cases you're now the man and turn around and live the intersectionality that you professed all these years. You sort of, many of you, and I'm being dramatic, but you sort of stood on the shoulders of we shall overcome to convince the American public that you were part of a civil rights pantheon. It's time to live as if you are. You did nothing, nothing when Trayvon Martin was bullied to death, even though you had massive investments in worrying about bullying against kids in schools. You do nothing with respect to voting suppression, even though the question of who can vote is a question of identity and gay leadership organizes around the proposition appropriate that an individual gets to determine what his or her or their identity is. If I could go on and on, we have gay, gays, principally white, principally male, have reached a pinnacle of power that we never dreamed of 30 years ago. The state of North Carolina, well, let me say it this way. The NCAA, which is about 80% African-American, stayed out of North Carolina over a transgender bathroom bill, not over massive voter suppression of black people. That is a sign of the clout of gays. So many of you have reached a pinnacle of power in American commerce where you get to call the shots. It's time to turn around and worry about how are, how are LGBTQ people doing with Section 8? How are we doing in the food stamp program? What's going on with public accommodations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We have sort of mastered the tax disadvantages of being domestic partners, and my domestic partner gets his insurance from IBM, but I am taxed on mine. Those are sort of the issues that we ran to Congress to fix. Nobody ever ran to Congress to worry about LGBTQ people in public housing, although there are far more of them than people at IBM. So I think it's time. I think you'll see some of the organizations move to that because I feel like some of the fights that they fought for the wealthy gays have been won. And organizations like to perpetuate themselves, and I think they're going to begin to shift. But they're not going to shift without progressives, without people of color, insisting that they do so. Power does not relinquish itself. And each of you makes individual fights. I've had my individual fights. Uh, but on a collective level, we have to force the uh, concentration of power within our own communities to shift their priorities and to act in a way that their rhetoric implied for 30 years. Great remarks, wonderful thoughts. Thank you, thank you, Robert. So we just have a few more minutes here. Um, I've asked everyone to take about a minute or two 
if you have any closing remarks you'd like to make, Vendita. Sure. I always have one more thing to say. So, um, so this is well within my wheelhouse. I guess I'd like to share that I think what a lot of us are trying to say is that the hierarchies that exist out in the world also exist um, within the queer community um, and in our organizations. And so um, to the extent that, um, that there is a, um, a problem with patriarchy um, and sexism, that exists in the queer community to the extent that there is um, a problem with um, socioeconomic status. Um, that exists within the queer community. And to the, the extent that there is racism in broader society, that exists within the queer community. Um, that um, these hierarchies don't just stop just because you experience some level of marginalization. Um, and that it's imperative um, that if any of us want full access to our freedom, that we continue to fight for the freedom of others where, wherever it is that you sit. And to do that, um, as Taylor mentioned, not only are you going to have to um, pull out your wallet, um, it's why the question of reparations um, is a repeated conversation, um, sometimes in different forms, but it continues to come up because um, all of the um, dynamics that we talk about um, are the result of, of our country's original sin. Um, uh, but you're also going to have to be ready to be incredibly uncomfortable. Um, systems do not change. Um, people do not change um, when they feel safe. Um, I don't believe in safe spaces. Don't invite me to your safe space. Um, uh, we need to get uncomfortable and we need to start challenging ourselves and challenge each other. I invite everyone to challenge me. I have problematic thoughts. I am a, a child of this society. I have problematic thoughts. I have problematic actions. Um, challenge me on them. I will fight you on some of them and I'll relinquish on others. Um, but let's continue to move um, boldly together um, in the right direction because every moment is an opportunity for us to make a new and different choice. Um, and so um, we need to let go of the despair. As a society, we handle hard things all the time. Um, we think about, you know, we've got cars that you plug into the wall and people fly to the moon and people do all sorts of things that you never would have imagined um, people could do 100 years ago, 50 years ago, um, even 15 years ago. Um, and so we need to let go of the fact that we, um, that, that um, this is, we say that this is a problem that's, that's baked, racism is a problem that's baked in our society. Um, yes, um, but it's time to get out our microwaves and start unbaking it or figure out how we are going to make um, things just a little bit different. So I invite everybody to try some new things. I invite you to fail. Um, I invite you to dust yourself off and I invite you to keep walking. Let's walk together. Wonderful. Thank you, Vincenzo. Robert. Any I appreciate. I appreciate the invitation to fail. I'm. I'm going to need that. Thank you. Oh, my comments thank are to thank you. Thank you all for your leadership uh, and your willingness to put yourself out there. The uh, the personal remains political. The political remains personal. So, people living your experiences and being transparent about it and being authentic is just such a blessing. And I'm grateful. I'm grateful to see more and more spaces that are permitting us to do it. Thanks, Robert. And finally, Taylor. Well, what should I say? Um, no, first I do wanna say thank you. This has been so inspiring. Um, uh, just meeting you all and having this panel and hearing, um, you know, meeting people like you and that have experiences like you and have the same ideas and um, are on the same page, um, That that's huge. Um, I just want to echo um, what Bendita said. It is going to be hard. It is going to be painful. It's not going to be anywhere um, as hard and painful as the history of racism in this country. I can assure you of that. Um, but at the same time, um, it's happening. And I don't think, I do believe that we have reached a juncture where LGBTQ rights are no longer moving forward unless they expressly incorporate racial justice. Um, and so that's where we are. And so I think it's either get on board or get left behind. Um, and I just urge you to do what you can. Um, and I also, I wrote down a definition of racism. It's a definition that I made up, but I'll just go ahead and say it um, because I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page. 
Um, it's more than interpersonal. It's not just calling someone a bad word. Um, it's implicit bias. It's refusing to acknowledge the after effects of slavery, segregation, and continuing criminal and economic oppression, and just understanding the realities of black people in this country and choosing an action. That's racism to me. Um, inaction is, is, is death. Um, silence is death. And so we all have a duty in this country to stand up and do what's right. And I promise you, we'll all come out for the better on the other side. Wonderful closing comments. I have nothing to add. Let me just close by saying Black Lives Matter. They really do. And we need to move forward in this country. Um, we're going to open it up to questions now. Thank you.